before we look at the scriptures, I, I just want us to, to realize, I was just thinking before, as we were worshiping, I want us to realize that, that the work that God did, when he came and he became a man, he, was, he became a man, it was not the same thing as, and I, you just pardon the, the illustration here, but it was not the same thing as Pinocchio and his maker. God of creation didn't look down and said, well, you know, let me, let me make a, a puppet and I'll control that puppet and I'll let that puppet go to a cross and that puppet uh, will die and, and kind of, you know, I'll be in control. No, the God of creation, the creator of us all, became the puppet. He came and humbled himself, the Bible says. He, became, he came in the form of a servant. He came in the likeness of even our sinful nature, came in the form of flesh. And I am, I'm thankful that he wasn't like Pinocchio. I'm glad that he didn't tell lies, that he was not untruthful. I'm glad that he wasn't deceitful, and I'm certainly glad that his nose didn't grow, you know. I'm thankful for that. But similarities I see because I remember him as a son of man saying that just like Jonah had to go in the great fish or the well, for three days, so must the Son of Man, is what he said. And, of course, we know that's exactly what happened, that, that Jesus, as the Son of Man, the Son of God, he went into the grave for three days. But how many know that on the third day, that he did not stay there in the grave, that the God of creation was revealed once again, he took his rightful place, it was all known, that he didn't send a puppet in his place, but he came as the, the living sacrifice for each and every one of us. Now, that ties into what we're going to talk about tonight, and you'll understand here briefly uh, as we look at this. But it's very important for us to know that we have a God that, is, that loves us and that has paid for our sins. And the Bible says that if we will confess our sins, that he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. And that is a promise. That's not just a statement. That's a promise that we have tonight, and I'm thankful for that. As we look at the scriptures, I know we last week our pastor began to share with us this passage in Ephesians chapter 6. And then I realized that he read verses 10 through 17. I'm going to read the first few just to kind of get us to the, the place where we're going to start. I'm going to read out of the Amplified uh, Version, the Amplified Bible, as you, you would call it, still a literal translation, starting with verse number 10, in conclusion, be strong in the Lord, be empowered through your union with him, in other words, draw your strength from him, that strength which it, his boundless might provides, put on God's whole armor. The, army, uh, the armor of a heavy-armed soldier with God's supplies, that you may be able successfully to stand up against all the strategies and the deceits of the devil. For we are not wrestling with flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, uh, but against the despotisms, against the powers, against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness against the spirit forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural sphere therefore put on god's complete armor that's what we're talking about is putting on god's armor that you might be able to resist and to stand your ground on the evil day of danger and having done all the crisis demands to stand firmly in your place stand therefore Hold your ground. Having tightened the belt of truth around your loins and having put on the breastplate of righteousness or of integrity or moral rectitude and right standing with God. And that's where I'd like to stop tonight as we look at this because there are several things that obviously uh, are that just kind of speak to me. Uh, Understanding, first of all, I guess we should start with understanding what is being asked of us here and what is the setting. We understand that we 
are in the middle of uh, battle. We're in the middle of fighting. Every day that you decide to live for God, you are fighting in the war. You don't have a choice whether you will fight or not in the sense of whether you will be in the war or not, I should rather say. But you, the only choice you have is whether you will look to God's word as your direction and as your light and fight on the Lord's side. That's your choice. Or you could choose to take on your own armor and try to fight it with your frustrated ways to, to your flesh and what seems right to you. Or you could choose God's way. And you can look to him as your strength. In other words, let us understand that this armor is not ours. This armor comes from God. This is not your armor. This is not my armor that you have to put on. This is God's armor. Otherwise, you would get confused when you look at this. You would think, well, I'm supposed to put on, as Pastor talked about, the helmet of salvation. So I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to, on my mind and my thoughts to think about how I'm to bring about salvation. That's the humanistic way. That's the natural way. That's the, how it's normal. And, and it's how you, uh, that's your default way of dealing with things, how you can figure it out, how you can deal with it, how you can control the situation, how you can rectify the situation to bring about your purpose and cause. Those are all the normal. Nothing wrong with that per se. You're, you're born with that, I guess. Or you can choose to take on the armor of God. Now, think about this. What about the belt of truth? Whose truth? Is it your truth? So you're supposed to, every day, you're supposed to arm yourself with your truth. You're supposed to be right. Okay, you could say that. Or what about righteousness? You're supposed to arm yourself every day with righteousness. Now, you don't want to be, you don't want to get confused there because, again, as we look at this, it'll make more sense as we go very quickly. If I go too fast, just kind of, Slow me down, okay? But we're going to try to, to look at a couple of different scriptures tonight, and I don't know how far we'll even get into this, but I will follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's, I guarantee you that. As we look at this, we have to be careful because it's never going to be about our righteousness. It's not about a Brother Bracken's righteousness. The Bible clearly tells us what God thinks about our righteousness. It clearly tells us that if we, were to arm, if we armed ourselves with our own righteousness, uh, that would be kind of a, a, a strained uh, situation because our relationship with Jesus Christ would suffer. It would. Because the Bible says that, that our righteousness is not anything pleasant unto the Lord. In fact, the Lord sees it as a, a polluted garment. It is something that is detestable to him. When he looks at us and... and in our normal way of thinking, in our normal, our righteousness, our normal way of reacting to a situation, our normal way of dealing with a situation within our own power, our righteousness, what we can concoct. Don't you know that your work that you do for God is really small? Your work that you do for God is really small. It undermines God's plan for your life. If you... Do it within your power, you have totally limited, and you've taken God. Let's just put it where it's at. Let's just not really kind of insinuate. Let's just say it as it is. You have eliminated God from the equation. You no longer need him, and therefore, whatever you come, whatever conclusion you arrive at, it's yours. You are the answer. You are the provider. And we have to be careful because it can happen even when, as we do the work of God. Deceive that we're doing the actions of God when he may be requiring something entirely different. Now, I'll further explain myself here in just a moment. But I just want to, to get you thinking about whose armor is this? This is not put on the armor every day. So you've got to put on, put on your truth, your, 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 your way of salvation, your, your thoughts about salvation, how you can save the situation and where you're at, figure it out, and come up with a solution. Boy, that puts a lot of pressure on us when we think that way. When we take on the responsibility of all the battle is ours, that's a really difficult situation to be in, trust me. We all are faced with that decision every day, myself included. We have to decide, okay, is this battle mine or is it the Lord's? Am I going to base it on my righteousness and my way of doing things, my way of figuring out the situation, or will I 
decide to, to follow the way of God. And while listen, let me, let me be more clear. I, I'm going to kind of go out of order here. Let me find it here. Let's look at uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 6. And I'm just going to, just as I feel the need to go a particular direction, I'm going to try to bring it all together here. As we look at Romans chapter 8, verse 6, I'm going to read it out of the Amplified Version. Again, it's a, it's a literal translation. And where there is um, hard to give you one word in the English that's to give us the meaning from the Greek here, uh, it does something neat and it puts in parentheses and tells us some further synonyms or, or gives us further explanation. That's all that it is. It stays true to a literal translation. If anything is uh, further explanation, it's put within parameters or parentheses. But notice this. Watch this. Romans 8, 6. I can't tell you how many times in my life I've looked over this scripture. I, if we would be honest, most of us have. We just, oh, yeah, that's great. Uh, skip over it. I'm done with my daily reading. But as we read it and begin to study it out, this is very accurate. It says, now the mind of the flesh, which is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit. Did you catch that? The mind of the flesh is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit is death. Death that comprises all of the miseries arising from sin, our normal sinful nature. We begin to feel the, the consequences of our sinful nature. We began to, I'll explain that further. Let me just finish the scripture. Both here and hereafter. But the mind of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, is life, notice this, and soul peace, both now and forever. In other words, you have two options every day. Everyone here has an option. You have an option. Will you have the mind of the Spirit or will you have the mind of the flesh? That's your two options. Every day you have that option. If you choose the mind of the flesh, which, which is sense and reason. Sense, that's your, that's your feelings. That's your emotions. That's, that's, what you, that's how you respond. If you're human, you respond that way. That's how you were ingrained. Your normal, your carnal man, your normal way of dealing with it is what you feel. And reason, reason is logic, is what you think about it. It's, it's, it's when you're worrying about the situation so greatly because you're, you're and, and, and you do feel the consequences of death, death to your joy, death to your peace, death to your focus and clarity and communication to God. You begin to immediately, that's how, and I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'll just clue you in. That's how you can tell what mind you're operating in. What's dying around you? How, how much joy do you feel? How much peace do you feel? Because those are the fruit of the Spirit. They identify, is the tree growing? What is growing out of your life? If things are dying, there should be concern because that allows you to realize, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I'm just talking from my personal experience, what I have learned uh, even over the last several months, things that, I, that is really has spoken to me, and I, I'm living this out. You began to be challenged when you think of in your own mind. You have an option. What about the mind of the spirit? It brings life. It brings not just peace. The Greek there is soul peace. It means deep down inside of you. There, it doesn't mean that the situation is done away or your sickness is taken away. Or it doesn't mean that, that your banking account miraculously has got five grand more than it did the day before. It doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean that at all. But what it does mean is, is that you can have peace. There's life. Jesus said that the thief cometh but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I've come that you may have life and it more abundantly. In other words, the, the way that you can tell which mind you're operating in is, is, is by what's going on in your life. Are you operating by your feelings and emotions and by your logic without the Holy Spirit, without inviting God into the situation? It's real easy to answer that question if you'll be honest. The reason why this is important is because when we realize that we began to put on God's armor, not our own armor, we're putting on God's armor. And when we put on the, the breastplate of righteousness, it's not our righteousness. There's a confidence that comes when we realize what righteousness we're putting on. We're putting on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That gives you confidence, doesn't it? Doesn't it allow you to boldly become before the throne of grace? Because 
you're not standing before him in something that is, is detestable, something that, that causes him to step back. You're standing before him with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said in Galatians that if you have been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. In other words, I mean, here's your options. And this is, this is why you should be asking yourself these kind of questions. That, that when you stand before God on Judgment Day, which righteousness do you want to have? Do you want your righteousness, which you already know how that will be judged accordingly to what you have done or what you haven't done? Or do you want to stand before God with the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Do you want to stand before him being covered by the blood of the Lamb? Do you want to stand before him where your sins are forgiven and washed away and never to be brought back up again? Why? Because you have a choice. See, God provides the armor. But he requires you to put it on. There, there you go. He will not put it on you. Now, this is not, this is not, um, it, it is to me, this is, and, and most of us, we're, we're New Testament, you know, under the New Covenant. This was not new language. In fact, if I can, just very quickly, I want you to see what's going on here. Can I, can I share with you something from the Old Testament? Please don't t- tune me out because this is actually really powerful. Will you, will you read with me or, or, or at least, uh, look, let's look at Isaiah chapter 59. I know it's Old Testament, it's Old Covenant. You got to look at it like, you know, I'm not a teenager anymore. I'm not in my 20s anymore, Brother Austin, you know. I'm not in my young 30s anymore. And some of you could keep going on for many, many multiplications, of course, but we won't go there. But what my point is, is we're not children anymore, most of us. There's some children, not, not just here, not here. Most of you are growing up, becoming young adults and what have you. But you can't discount my childhood. You can't discount my, my teenage years. You can't discount who I was in my 20s and my early 30s. Who I was then is who I am now, just in a different way. And you understand about a little bit why I act the way I do because of things that happened along the way and so that's why we can't discount when the old testament you're gonna miss a lot about what god wants to show us he's the same god yesterday today and forever you want to know about more about god get out of just the new testament there's your homework right there you want to discover more about god and discover how merciful he really is look in the old testament what mercy in the in the old testament yes what about grace? That's a New Testament. No, it's not just a New Testament concept. It's all found all throughout. God's favor, unmerited, even to people that weren't Israelites, that weren't his own people. He reached out, talked to Nineveh, talked to all of the, the various places that still they were created in his image. Don't you realize that we all are creations of him? Don't you realize that we all bear his image? Now, without having the spirit of God, we have a distorted image of God. We're like a mirror. Sin was like a stone that was cast into the mirror. It shattered the image, and it never began to have that true reflection as it did originally. That's what was in the garden. That's what happened. But the Holy Spirit is what restores that image. The more we submit to Christ, the more we begin to reflect more of Christ. That's what happens. When you begin to to pray to God and allow him to move in your life, what happens? People start to see more of Jesus through you. They start to see the light become brighter because less of you is shining. They begin to see the true light. And Jesus did say, or John recorded it, that, that we were to be the light of the world. It was supposed to be translated from he was the true light, Jesus, but we were to become the light in the world. But Isaiah chapter 59 I'm going to read before a a familiar passage that you're so used to. And if I read it there, then you would tune me out because you know everything about this passage. Of course, everybody does. If you've gone here more than three weeks, you know the whole Bible. Memorize it, know all of the, you know, exegetical research, and you could spit it out. And and the the triad of the Hebrew language, the first three, you could could break it down, I'm sure. But that's why I'm not going to do that because I don't want any of you to embarrass me and be able to quote this. I want to read it in context. So 
Let's, uh, let's start at verse number 15. This is an interesting, very interesting. We're going to actually see some of what we, I just mentioned in the New Testament. Believe it or not, it was actually in the Old Testament. This is interesting, really interesting. This is where it came from. This is where Paul got his idea. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He began to look at the situation, the dealings of men, the dealings amongst his people, and he saw that there was no justice being done. So what did he do? He saw there was no man and wondered that there, that there was no intercessor. Therefore, watch this, watch this. Therefore, he armed, he, his own arm brought about salvation for him, and his own righteousness, it sustained him. Watch what he did. This is the Lord. This is the God of creation. Watch what he did, okay? For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And this is the Lord. This is his army. This is his armor. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. We don't see that one in the New Testament. But it's implied. If you research it, it's implied because it's, it's the context. We're drawing it out of the original. They understood this was not... Let's, let's put on the armor so we can see how much, if I just stand here, and I'll, I'll bring this up here in a moment, was not talking about you stand here and just let the enemy just take its best shot at you. And you just, the armor's just not going to, it's going to allow you just to sit there and take it. That's what it means. No, 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 no. That's not what it means at all. It's not about that at all. In fact, it's the opposite of that. It's action. And was clad with zeal as a cloak. And according to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. The coastlands he will fully repay. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, this is the part you know. The spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The redeemer will come to Zion. And to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. I have just as much proof when you look at the scripture as a whole and in this passage in context that this armor that we put on God's armor we take on the attitude of God and it is not an armor to stand there and allow the enemy just do whatever he wants to do it is an armor of bringing about the justice of the Lord that's what it's about it is bringing about that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church that's what it's really about when we put on the breastplate of righteousness when we put on the righteousness of god we begin to take on the character of god the zeal of the lord we begin to take on the attitude do you think a really sovereign god a righteous god will sit down and allow things to not be done the right way the way he created them do you think that he would be silent Do you think that he would allow, oh, injustice, I'll just yawn at it. I'll look the other way. No, that's what we're looking at. This passage brings that out. He had enough. He said, no man will be an intercessor. No one will step up to the plate and bring justice. No one will, will bring the, the right things to, to, to pass, the righteousness. No man or woman will do what's right. The Bible says that he put on. His armor to do a purpose. He took on an attitude of action. That's what he did. He took on an attitude of this is this is too much. Not going to happen any longer. That's what we're really talking about here tonight. It's about when we began to realize that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Now I know, I know it's easy because in our default, it's easy to look at it through our own eyes. We can see every situation through our own logic, without the Holy Spirit, through our own feelings. I don't feel the same way you feel about it. Well, that's not what the Bible asks us to do. It says, what saith the word of the Lord about the situation? The Spirit brings life. It doesn't bring death. The Spirit brings soul peace. Why do we have to put on the breastplate of righteousness? It's so it protects our heart. The Bible clearly states in Proverbs that, that you're to guard your heart with everything you can. You've got to guard your heart because out of it flows the issues of life or out of it flows all issues of life. 
There is not one thing in your life that is not touched by what's going on in your heart, whether you know this or not. What's going on deep down in the Bible, biblical days, it's not just your, it's not your physical heart. It's actually deeper beyond the normal uh, reasoning of the mind. It's deeper than that. It's, it's who you really are. It's that, it's, that, it's that kind of, that inner voice that you have, that when nobody else is around, that, that conversation that you wrestle with, that's your heart. That's your heart really ticking. And that's why it's important that, that like Pastor talked about, the helmet of salvation, that we have to realize that it's the salvation of the Lord, acknowledging that it, His armor, when we put on the helmet of salvation, we're essentially, we're also acknowledging He is our salvation. He will save us from the situation. He will bring us out. He will bring hope that it's not over. It's not done with. The Lord is my salvation. That's what you're doing when you put His armor. And it also makes you to be active. You're not going to just sit around, okay, I'll just, you know, allow... You know, things would be wrong. No, you'll be, you'll be proactive. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to rush in every situation and begin to correct things because that really may be the mind of your flesh based off of what you feel about the situation or what you think about the situation. No, no, no. Trust me. I mean, I know just in my own personal life, that would be dangerous. I mean, I'm talking across the board. This is like you go back into my teenage years. That would be dangerous. Dangerous. Do what I feel, Brother Lucas? What I feel is the right thing to do? That's almost like the Bible when they did that which was right in their own eyes. Kind of the same type of attachment. That's dangerous ground right there. What I feel, because feelings, when we allow for ourselves to open up our feelings, it opens a door that the enemy can deposit inside of us things and control us. That's what happens. When you allow your feelings, that's where you get hurt. That's where bitterness comes in. That's where things that are more than the surface, it begins to infect your spirit. You can't afford that. You can't afford it. That's why we got to have God's righteousness, His integrity, His completeness, protecting us so that our heart is protected. Because what goes on in here, the Bible says that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's why it's important that your heart is protected. Now, if none of the things that I just mentioned, that you would be like God, that you would take on the actions of God, the attitude of God, that you would uh, do the work of God by putting on his own armor and, and not, no longer um, be pacified of the situations going on in your life, here's a question for you. How long will you be silent? What will it take for you to finally put on the armor of God and begin to do his work? How long... How far will you go in your situation and your trials before you begin to really start to pray to God? I'm not talking about words here. I'm, all, I'm actually talking about confession of what's going on in your heart. Because, see, you can't put the righteousness of God around your heart. It's not, it's, this is not an external thing here, even though it gives us the imagery and the analogy of external. This is really talking about a spiritual thing that's going on. And so you got to realize that God wants to deal and protect us and to keep us because out of, out of our heart, even Jesus said that out of the, the heart, the mouth speaks. That's why Jesus later on in John 7, he said that he that believeth on, the, on, on me, as the Scripture saith, out of his belly shall what flow rivers of living water. Why? Because out of the heart flows all of the, of the things, the issues of life, everything. It comes from the heart comes from the heart so if that's not enough if you didn't want to have on the attitude of God and and to do the actions of God and and you didn't want to think like God and you didn't want to to bring about the justice of God and and you didn't want to really be associated with God that'd be a tough one to sell wouldn't it as a Christian didn't want to be associated with God what about this scripture let's take a look I'm just thinking here this is a new one for me and, and you you can you, you probably know this one already but the way I see this, oh, am I doing on time? Okay. Let's look at, let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3. I'll be honest, I've heard this passage, and there's another one that's, that's quoted as well that ties right into this. But this is the main one. I, I, I'm almost embarrassed a little bit how many times I've read this passage. And I've never noticed what I'm about to share with you. 
and uh, really it's changed a lot of things. This thing, this issue about having peace with God is important. This thing about protecting your heart is a big deal. If you don't think protecting your heart affects your family, affects everything around you, it's a big deal. It's a really big deal. And it starts with taking on God's armor, his righteousness. But 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, But we look for new heavens and new earth according to his promise, in which righteousness, uprightness, freedom for sin, right standing with God, is to abide. Verse 14. I want you to take notice of this. This is, in, this is important. So, beloved, since you are expecting these things, you're expecting new heavens and new earth according to his promise, and who is his righteousness is going to abide forever. You're expecting that to happen. You're, you're expecting him to come back. You're, you're expecting him to come. He's not, you know, you go into Luke where he says, you know, blessed is a servant when he come that that the master or the Lord finds so doing, is active, that is doing, doing the work of the Lord's request. And then a little bit further, and then he, he says, he gives a, Jesus gives a parable, and he says, blessed is the servant that when the master comes or the Lord comes, that he's, that he's watching or seeking for his return. There's two things, doing and seeking. That's our challenge. We have to be actively. That's why it's important to put on the Lord's army because we take on his attitude. We begin to do his work. We don't, we don't wait for someone else to be the intercessor. This is the time for us to intercede for our generation, for our family, for those around us, for those at our workplace, those at our school. They need young people to put on the armor of God. Our world needs everyone that's here tonight and, and those that will come on Sunday to put on the armor of God and begin to do the work of the Lord. Take on the attitude of the Lord. Not be satisfied to see injustice done all around us. It's time to raise up an army. But Paul says, or I'm sorry, Peter says at this, in this particular passage, 2 Peter 3, 13, uh, 14, he says, So, beloved, since you are expecting these things, there's going to be a new heaven and new earth, be eager to be found by him at his coming. Watch this. Without spot. Or blemish. That's where I've always heard it stop. And it just in my, and maybe I'm just deaf and I haven't heard. But there's another part to it. There's another leg there. And at peace. When he comes, not just spot, not just wrinkle, but at peace. In serene confidence, free from fears and agitating passions and moral conflicts. That's what that word there, peace, means in the Greek. At peace. Let me ask you, this is going to be a difficult one. That's why I'm going to preface it this way. You might be able to say, well, I'm without, you know, I'm without spot. I'm without wrinkle. What about your soul? Is it at peace? If he came tonight, do you have peace? How is your soul? I know you can, you could, I don't want you to respond. But I want you to think about this because this is important. That's why this ties back to your heart, your soul. Now, these are the first two, it seems, that these are external um, analogies. It's talking about a garment. You know, we're to have the, the garment ready for his return, our, our wedding garment. But in reality, when you look at this, this is all three of these are directly talking about the condition of the soul. Without spot. How are you on your heart? Not on the outside, surface, apostolic facade, but your heart. How is your heart when no one else is around? How is your heart? Is it without spot? How do you get wrinkles? Well, there's a lot of explanations you could say, but one of the greatest ways when you study it and what have you is the casualness. When you don't realize how important, how formal this really is. When you become casual, I have to instruct one of my sons um, every once in a while because he's learning and he's doing a great job. I won't tell you which one it is. But when mom and dad, he switches to men's sizes, and mom and dad's paying men prices on suits and clothing, uh, you know, the expectation goes up of the, the treating of 
of the garment. Now, some of you don't, don't know anything about this, but it, trust me, it's interesting. But one of my sons sometimes forget this principle that I have these nice dress slacks. I have this nice suit on. I can't. Oh, what, what am I? What am I? What am I doing? I didn't. Oh, I. Oh, that a wrinkle my pant. Oh, okay. Uh, what what do I? What do I need to do? Um, and th this is just a kind of a joke because there is a there is a period of time where some teenagers, all the dots aren't connected, and that's completely okay. I say this all fun. We we have great fun, but. But it is true. Uh, it is a teaching opportunity. We'll just put it that way. It is a teaching opportunity. But the casualness, not realizing, hey, I've got a suit on. I, got, I, got a, I sit differently. I act differently. I don't do what I do when I have, you know, jeans and a T-shirt like you were doing yesterday, you know, teaching him and did a great job of taking out weeds and stuff around the house. Did a great job. I was proud of it. I really was. He had a little fun. I gave him some extra things that he could do while I was doing that and had a good time. But you, you act differently when you have a suit on, when you're dressed a little bit more formally. So without spot, but also wrinkle, how casual has your soul become? Again, just a question. You answer that. I'm not, I've have, I've keep digesting this for quite a while now, the last several weeks, and it's really convicted me. But here's the other one, the peace. What about your soul? Soul peace. You know, that only comes, remember what we read? Just one of the many passages I could bring up. But just, just look at Romans 8, 6. Amplified version kind of draws that out, helps you a little bit. But there's only one thing I know that gives us soul peace, the Bible tells us. It's the Spirit. The Spirit is the only thing that brings life. Our old man, our, our carnal nature is what brings death. It brings destruction. It brings darkness. It brings confusion. It brings all sorts of evil, the Bible says. But it is the Spirit that brings life. It brings revelation. It brings light. It brings hope. It brings joy. It brings soul peace. So why is this important? I, I'm, I'm done. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end there. Why is it important to take on the, the breastplate of righteousness? Because we've got to protect our heart. We've got to protect what's going on inside there. But also, more importantly, God is waiting for us to take on his attitude. God is waiting on us to take on his attitude and his actions. No more injustice. No more sitting by. No more, more casually just, well, we'll, we'll kind of, no, 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 no. The work of God, just like we saw, and you saw it, Scripture is very clear what God said. I, I looked, and there was there's no one to, to raise up, no one that would intercede, no one would do it. So I had to do it myself. I love that passage, and it really convicts me a lot. That's where that, if the enemy comes in like a flood, that's in that context is where that's coming from. It's even more powerful in my, from on my side of things when I look at it in that light that the Lord, the Lord has armed himself to do war. Just remember this. It's not your armor. It's the Lord's armor. But he asks you to put it on. He asks you to arm yourself with these things. Take on his attitude. Ask the Lord to help you. It's not your righteousness. So get that out of, out of the picture. Don't, don't allow the enemy to bring condemnation into your heart. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying his best to put on you, get you to put on your own righteousness. He wants you to operate in your own, your own salvation, your own truth, what you think is the truth, your own good news, what you can, what you can bring up in the situation. You're, you're trying to create your own good news. You're trying to create your own truth. Stop it. The Lord has provided His armor, His truth, His salvation, His good news. We'll, I'm sure these things will be discussed coming up, but it's the Lord's armor. And the Lord, the Bible tells us in Psalms 24, the Lord is strong and mighty. The Lord is mighty in battle. The Bible tells us in Psalms chapter 144 and verse 1 that he will teach our hands to war. So if you're having difficulty, okay, well, what am I supposed to do now? You need to bring up Psalms 144 verse 1 and pray, God, teach my hands to war because there is a war going on. 
and I want to be a part of it. I'm not going to take this sitting. I'm not going to let injustice happen. I'm not going to let my, my loved ones go to hell. I'm not going to get the, my friends, my, my relatives. No, I'm going to put on the whole armor of God. I'm going to stand and see the salvation of the Lord. I'm going to allow him to do his work. Allow him to transform our lives. Can we just pray tonight as we end this service? Lord, I thank you so greatly for being with us tonight. Allow your word to take root in our hearts, each one of our hearts and our minds. Go with us, Lord. Help us to take and to place your armor upon us each and every day, Lord. Help us to take on your attitude, to do your actions, God, to see the salvation of the Lord being taking place in our own world today, God, our generation, our families, God. Let the peace of the Lord go with us tonight. I pray let the peace of the Lord go into every home and every heart. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ.